Um, greetings, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to attend my talk today. It's most appreciated. Before I go further, I should probably make a small apology. Today's weather is really strange today and it's wreaking havoc with my allergies. So if I go into a coughing fit, don't worry, I'm not ill. It's just my allergies being stupid. So I would apologize in advance. Um, now we've covered that. So let's go on with things properly. As we have lots of people who've kindly turned on their video, can we have a quick show of hands? How many people here work in ops? Your hands up. Okay, we've got a couple. Good stuff. All right. How about DevOps? Oh, one, two. Okay, not bad. System devs, developers. Oh, yep, we're getting a lot more hands now. Excellent stuff. And finally, sys admins. Oh, we've got a few hands. Oh, well done. Thank you for the honesty, people. It's always nice to see what kind of balance we have. Thank you very much. So without further ado, let's have a look at how not to fail at distributed systems with examples from React part two. Yay, moving on already. So in today's talk, we're going to go through an obvious one, an introduction for people who haven't seen me before and want to know what's going on. We're going to go for a talk about reviewing your work to actually delve further into depth of where problems can originate from. We have a section called accepting just accepting the facts where we go into how customers can approach troubleshooting in different and creative manners the importance of being earnest where we build on this and show how in many support related situations customers don't always quite give you exactly what you're looking for and then at the end of the session we're going to wrap up with a brief uh, q a where you get to share whatever questions you have with us um, the talk itself will be approximately 20 minutes long. So, yep, sit back, enjoy, and listen in tight in case you need to put up your hands every now and again. So, introduction. Who am I? Well, having just had an excellent introduction from Kenji, you probably don't need to hear this much. But, yep, as he said, head of support at TI Tokyo, 26 year veteran of tech support. I've worked in React support for over five years. I am a contributor to the React open source project. And I am the packager for React KV226 onwards. And the most recent release is 3.06 now, which was released a couple of weeks ago. So people may have noticed this is part two. Well, what about part one? People might be quite concerned that they didn't attend that, so they don't know what's going on. However, part one was more focused on high level processes, whereas part two is more about the day to day where we have a much stronger help desk theme. So let's move into the talk overall. Start off with reviewing your work. And to begin this, has anybody here worked on proof of concept code before? Yep, start of a new project. Oh, yeah, I've got one hand, two hands, three hands, excellent stuff. So you've probably been to this one where you're given a very vague spec and have to work with it as well as you can. So this is actually goes back in time to one of my first programming jobs I actually had to do. Um, I was approached and I was told, we'd want you to do a function. So we're going to give you some data. We're going to give you an ID. And from this table, which is a very simple table at the moment, but will grow later, we'd like you to return the customer name and the customer's telephone. Not exactly rocket science, but hey, <clears throat> That's the kind of thing you give to a low level programmer when they're starting in their first job. So I sat down at my computer and I began to code. And as I'm one of the first speakers at an Erlang and Elixir based conference after the keynote, I thought for the first bit of code you should see in this conference should be some PHP followed by a dash of SQL just to keep you on your toes. And without further ado, so PHP, we're delving straight in. Um, for simplicity factor, this has been simplified a lot. So error handling, et cetera, has all been removed for ease of uh, reading. So we create a very simple SQL statement, select everything from the customer data table where the ID is whatever ID we've been given. This was a WAMP stack for people who remember those. And it was an ODBC call to the database. So we call the database and say, give us the results. While the database has results, 
We then take the name field returns and stick that in the name section of the result array. And we take the telephone data received and we stick that in the telephone data of the result array and everything's fine and dandy and happy and we're good. And that was the first section I ever wrote. Huzzah. Then, of course, this is told to be a make it a function. So we had to write a function call around it. And this was incredibly simple. Take an array, which we're going to call customer data. We're going to have an ID and we're going to stick in the results from customer ID data ID, the function we just wrote. So that gives us then an ID based on the customer ID, which then returns the array of customer data. Not exactly magic. People have probably written much more complicated things before in their sleep. And that's where my job finished. No longer my problem. I don't have to worry about it. But one of the design specs that we had to make sure is the table is going to grow. Sorry, I should probably go back. The table is definitely going to grow. So we need to make it so any other developers can just copy and paste in extra lines at the bottom of my function. So we did. Now, this is where they wrote a wrapper around my function. So they decided they needed for admin purposes, a list of uh, what was going on. So they'd have a list of IDs, the customer name and the customer telephone. So they wrote a wrapper for every ID in this list of IDs variable as an ID, go get the ID and here's some customer data. Fine. So they wrote it, it ran, proof of concept was approved, it went into production and an issue happened and everybody had to sit down and think, what's going wrong here? Whenever we populate the customer data array with only the name and telephone, it still times out. When you look at the table and the table was originally pretty simple, I mean, function only returns name and telephone. It's not exactly a lot of data. So how do we fix it? What people thought, well, it's the obvious thing. It's timing out. There's a problem with Apache. So what do we do? We increase the Apache timeout. And it worked for about a month. And then we ran into the same problem again. So, okay, maybe Apache is not the problem. Where else should we look? So we thought, all right, well, let's look a bit further. How about MySQL? And maybe there's something wrong with that. So we tried tuning MySQL and we tuned it and we tuned it, we tuned it, and it didn't really do anything at all. So clearly it's not MySQL either. And at this point in time, the, pro the system only has a few thousand users and there's been no changes to my function at all. So, this thing worked wonderfully when we were doing testing. What's gone wrong with it? So we went back and we broke down every single part. So we're right back to the start. In production, we have data. And this is the original table, but they'd added new data. And some of the things added, so ID, name, telephone made sense. They went on they added other very simple things such as email address, gender. You know, nothing that will really break the camel's back. It's all very simple. But then after a bit more digging, we discovered they'd added one extra table, sorry, one extra column to the table, user tags. User tags was a very interesting column where every single tag that the users had added in the system was listed in here in a long comma separated list, which meant that every single user would have maybe one item for every single entry except in user tags, which could be a few thousand. Nice. But as we're only returning name and telephone, surely that should be fine. But then if we go back to the original spec, the function should return everything. So then any additional coders who come later can add on the extra stuff at the end. And we look back in, we are selecting everything from customer data, including all the user tags. So this is where things started to go wrong. We're selecting all this extra gumph that we don't need, which didn't exist when we wrote the function. And we're not just doing that. We're then compounding this by instead of picking up all of them at the same time, we're picking up ID after ID after ID thousands of times. So instead of one database call that would probably take maybe I don't know, half a second to a second to return. Instead, we're doing lots of microtransactions against the database, which means that it's slowly added up until the Apache finally keeled over once we were running a few thousand transactions with every call. And this is purely a problem with the code in the application itself. But if you notice the standard troubleshooting pro procedure we followed 
is we went to look at Apache first because we blamed our tools. And then we tried MySQL. And again, we blamed our tools, but it was none of those. It was the code we originally wrote that was the complete problem behind this. But people may be wondering, even though this is PHP and WAMP, this could easily be an application in PHP that uses a PHP client, just like my POC function did with ODBC, to talk to your distributed system. So I can't guarantee this is true for your case. What I can say is that React has multiple clients, including all the common ones, such as PHP, Java, Golang, Elixir, Ruby, Python, C Sharp, Node.js, and of course, Erlang. It's name of the main ones, but troubleshooting through the entire stack may be required to solve some of these problems. So you may have the best distributed system in the world, but if the application talking to it is horrendously flawed, no matter how much tuning or troubleshooting you do with your professional Erlang or Elixir-based system, it won't fix your problem. And that's why we really need to be careful in reviewing your work the whole lot, not just the target database. So I'd like to move on to there, to the next part of the talk, which is entitled, Just Accepting the Facts. And there's a wonderful quote I'd like to share with you here from an American business philosopher called Jim Rohn. And his quote is, there are some things you don't have to know how it works, only that it works. While some people are studying the roots, others are picking the fruit. It just depends on which end of this you want to get in on. And this statement is so true when you work in IT support for distributed systems. Um, I'm going to give you an example of one of our customers who was so obsessed with the roots, they were willing to let production systems that were actually blipping on and offline continue in that way until they were fully satisfied with why what we were recommending was happening. So the one that they had the biggest discussion on, well, second biggest, is transparent huge pages. Anybody here know what this is, what it does? Wow, I really expected somebody to know. Okay, well, um, very quickly, transparent huge pages is a function that was introduced in Linux kernel 2.6, if memory serves correctly, but it was introduced more recently. And what it is, is a very clever system that allows um, huge pages to be managed fully transparently by the system. So whether you're running on a laptop to do your regular desktop stuff, or whether you're using a server that's processing, I don't know, 30,000 web requests a second, this will automatically move memory around in the background to make sure you have the best thing available at the right time. Or at least that's the logic behind it. However, the customer in question, oh yeah, sorry, um, was coming to us and they gave us a debug and it shows up here. You see how I've highlighted a non-huge pages What's that? That's uh, 13 gig is being used by non-huge pages. That shows you how much memory is actually being used by transparent huge pages. And we recommended to them as they're having performance issues, turn this off. They're paying us for professional support. We looked at their uh, slash proc slash meminfo when we said you've got this much being used, turn it off and you will save memory. So the customer turns around and says, why? Well, fair enough. That's a good question. Why should we do that? So we gave them a link to the documentation. Here is a link from the documentation written for the product that you're using that says, we recommend disabling THP at boot time. So your average customer will look at this and say, okay, doc says we should turn it off. Let's turn it off. Oh, no, 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 no. Customer turns around to us and says, yeah, but why? Why should we do this? So we dig a little deeper and we say, well, okay, we're going to go another level further. Here is a page from Red Hat who made this function. And Red Hat did a lot of optimized testing and it says, THP is not recommended for database workloads. How many people knew that? Okay, well, I guess I'm special. Oh, no, there's somebody here. Excellent, well done there, man. Okay, so THP is not recommended for database workloads. And we said to the customer, well, 
where you're paid support professionals and we're telling you to turn it off, the documentation for the system you're using tells you to turn it off and the documentation for the operating system you're using tells you to turn it off. What do you think we're getting at here? No. Nope. <laughs> so the customer required us to go digging all the way down until we'd actually given them examples with diagrams of how transparent huge pages being on versus being off would make a mess of their memory config and slow down their database. Meantime, the customer, uh, sorry, the end client was losing money on this because their system kept going offline as they didn't have enough memory because they wouldn't turn it off. Customers are special sometimes, aren't they? And it's not just things like this. I mean, that one there, we've got three different sources saying what it is, but there are other functions as well. Another one that's surprisingly common in React is one called key listing users, especially in development um, procedures, like to see, well, what keys do we have in use? What's running? And in development, this is fine. Yeah, go do it, knock yourself out. It's a really handy thing to know so you can do all your tests and make sure everything works. However, in the documentation, exactly above where it tells you how to do it, we have this subtle warning of not for production use. This operation requires traversing all keys stored in the cluster and should not be used in production. That's right, it generates an incredible amount of additional load on your servers. This is a no-no, do not do. So you'd be surprised how many of our customers come to us and they say, we have an issue with our cluster. Okay, what kind of issue is it? Oh, it's really slow and the memory usage is rather high. Okay, can you send us the logs? Yeah, sure, all right. According to the logs, somebody's tried listing keys. Does your application do that? No, 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 we, we just run tests when, to make sure the cluster, is still, the cluster is still running. And we go back and we dig a bit more and we say, but this is definitely running. Somebody's definitely done that. We only ran some normal tests that we generally run. So after some further nudging and persuading, we get them to share their tests with us, after which their test to make sure their cluster is running is they list all the keys in the bucket. So just to make sure we've got that here, you're doing, your customer is, your cluster is suffering heavily and you just ran the most resource intensive command possible for the entire system that the doc specifically tell you do not use in production. Excellent, okay, fine. And with much pain and persuasion, we managed to get them to stop doing that and Slowly, we found out the real cause behind why their product cluster was originally in pain before they mucked it over with this. And the problem was eventually solved. So yes, this excerpt here is taken from the KV docs for 226, but we're proud to say that from React KV 2.9 and above, this is no longer an issue um, of relevance. 290, despite the numbering jump, is actually the successor to 226. Um, this is no longer an issue as we're now able to list keys safely in production due to some coding improvements. So yay, hopefully when customers make mistakes like that, it will no longer come back to bite them. So just before we move into our next section, I'm going to have a quick drink. And now we discuss the importance of being earnest. And what stops customers from being earnest? This is when they discuss their issues with their tech support, the people they pay to help them. So first of all, we have people with denial issues. They refuse to admit the problem. We have people who with ignorance who have no idea what the problem is. We have people who are too proud to admit what the problem is. We have some places that are too protective of their data and they don't really want to tell you. And there are some places where they think, well, we should probably report that at some point, and they just neglect the issue until the issue becomes so big that it becomes a serious problem. And just for your entertainment value, we have some typical exchanges we had with real world customers. So starting off, all of our nodes are showing high memory warnings. Okay, can you send us the logs? Did you change anything? When did it start? Here are the logs, we didn't change anything started about 3 p.m. The logs say that you changed your transfer settings at 
250. Oh, that's change. <sighs> Next slide, ignorance. Our cluster is suddenly writing, running like a dog. Do you have ish disk issues? Can you send us logs? No, disk should be fine. Logs are attached. The logs say that IO weight on disk three of server four is 99%. Okay, we'll replace it. Pride. Wow, this was an impressive battle we had with this customer. Off-site transfers keep restarting partitions. Okay. Looks like you're dropping packets. I think you have a network issue. We build and sell this kit. We do not have network issues. After some weeks of digging, the logs confirm it. Faulty switch. <laughs> Overprotection. We get occasional performance glitches. Please sh change the scheduler on server 476A3. Sure, which server is that? Uh, I don't know. That's what it was redacted to in the logs. Oh, I'll see if I can find out. And another typical one, neglect. This is the last of the five. We have high memory issues. When did you first notice it? About six months ago, and it's been getting worse. What was changed? Do you even have logs from then? I don't remember. The logs are set to rotate out every 90 days. All fun, but anyway, a quick show of hands. Anybody here has been on either side of a similar case to any of these? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, lots of people. Yes, a few smiles. Excellent. These are all familiar. There are even worse ones out there, but these are the ones we thought are suitable for this kind of audience. So yes, in these few examples taken from real life cases, the time from the start to the um, final solution took anything from a few days to a few weeks, but that delay could have been significantly mitigated had the customers been earnest with their support staff from the start. I mean, if you go to your doctor, say you don't feel right and then expect to be miraculously cured, you've got another thing coming. Yet this approach seems to be considered perfectly viable when in the world of IT support. Why? What is going on? You're paying for this. Your job depends on it, but still they take this bizarre attitude. And take a quick note of the time, we shall probably move on now to wrap up briefly. So in today's talk, we discussed how problems may not come from the most obvious places when we discussed reviewing your code. We saw how the studying the roots of the issue, um, but more often taking the fruits of another's work is far quicker to find your solution. And we also showed how when working with customers, the truth is really pure and never simple in the importance of being earnest. Okay, I've been Nick Adams. Thank you very much for your time. I most appreciate you listening. I'd like to move on to the questions and answers. Just before that, if anyone would like to contact me, details on the screen. If you want React support for us, um, contact us from details there. Check with the React community. There are some awesome people there on Post React on Slack. Check out the websites or if you want to play with React, go download a binary from the website listed there. Um, oh, one last thing I should probably mention. In the talk we did uh, for Codebeam v America, there was a question about where you can get the React Man. As part of that, we made some awesome t-shirts where we're willing to give away to these to anybody who either signs up for React support or can refer somebody to us with a reference to this talk in it. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for your time. Kenji, thank you very much for the awesome introduction. Thank you to Code Beam for letting me talk today and for TO Tokyo for letting me be here. I open the floor to any questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Nicholas. Excellent presentation. Now thank we're in the question and answer time. And um, please write down your questions on the FUBA uh, Q&A. How do I say Q on the board? And we actually we have answered two already two questions on the on the board. 
And I'd like uh, Nicholas to, if, if you have any answer to this, uh, the question is from Phil Dempster. Uh, Phil, are you there? All right, if you're not there, I, I can oh, read out. Yes, there is, there is hand. It's definitely yeah. there. I'm here, but I haven't got the question in front of me. So you write, you go ahead and read it out. Okay, I will. Uh, how big is an, how big an issue is head of line blocking in distributed Ireland? Whether the, where the internal communication is via TCP, and what existing mechanisms are there to mitigate it? Yep, and the answer I dropped in the chat earlier is OTP um, now has fragmentation of large messages, so they should no longer be so much of a problem. However, this was a serious issue in pre OTP twenty two. And for reference, if you see OTP issue 2133, that should then tell you how this is dealt with, with head of line blocking caused by sending very large messages over Erlang distribution. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I actually uh, uh, quickly searched Google and uh, there's a, a blog article in uh, OTP blog, which, uh, which is called OTP 22 highlights. It's by La Lucas Larson on the May, May 13th, 2019. And he actually mentioned uh, how to how he solved the problem with the uh, uh, of the head line of line head of line blocking with the fragmentation fragmented distribution messages. This is a new feature since uh, to uh, OTP 22. That's what I've confirmed. Okay, so any more questions? I think there's I think there's uh, if you have if anyone has question please uh, turn on your turn on your sound and ask ask we still have plenty of time there are two in the question section I'm not sure if your screen hasn't updated but the first question we've got is by I'm terribly sorry if I pronounce this wrong Heiko yeah. Goes is that how you pronounce that if I get it wrong I do apologize it's English how it's do, sorry it's easy it's, it's goes like in English. Oh, goes. I'm sorry. My apologies. Um, I've been living in Japan too long. I read things the wrong way. So how does React compare to ETS? I'm going to sound like a complete fool here and admit that I've never, ever touched ETS, so I can't answer that. But I can look it up and get back to you. Um, yeah, it has been asked already by your colleague, I think. ETS is a memory and only in process. I didn't know that. Sorry. And yours is uh, redistributed. Yes. Um, how should I come? Uh, if, if allow me to comment, ETS is tightly coupled with a beam, and the React is. Um, I think my understanding of React is it's rather a higher level application, of course, used using ETS and other LM components as the build, building blocks. So uh, it's really. I, I think it's. I don't know whether it's useful to compare ETS and React, but uh, uh, finding um, understanding the differences between the two two uh, technologies will be a good thing, and I th I'm I'm sure that uh, Nick Ross will answer later. Okay, yeah, I'll do what I can. Okay. Any other questions? Will the presentations file be available to download? by Patricio Dos Santos. Um, I, oh, the actual presentation itself, the slides. Good question. Um, they always do in the live versions of this. For the virtual ones, I'm afraid we'll have to grab somebody from organization. Is Barbara or Francesco about? Can they answer that, please? Uh, I'm here. I can answer. Uh, so the question is, will the presentation be available later? Yep. I'm happy to send it in for you to distribute if needed. So basically, we want a majority of the videos to be exclusive for just attendees. So those people who actually got the ticket, but we will make it available farther in the in the year, definitely. Oh, I but, think the question means the PowerPoint. Oh, OK, then uh, it's up to you, because I mean, you can share it with us. We can share it with the rest of the team or you can just tweet it. Um, and I'll, we can I'll forward copy after the talk. Does that work? Yeah, definitely. Okay, then let's do that. So please contact Barbara and she'll make wonderful things happen. We, we can just Very tweet good. it later after the talk. Okay. Very good. 
Okay, any other questions? If no questions, maybe we can wrap wrap this session up. And um, okay, maybe we can wrap this session. And if you have any further questions, please uh, contact Nicholas directly. I think he he will be he he will welcome you to answer. Yep. Right. I'm so answer questions if anything comes in. Oh, sorry. There's one thing I completely okay. forgot to mention, especially as we may have a decent amount of academia out there. Um, as part of trying to help the overall community, we're also running a scheme where we offer six months of free React support to Great. any um, startup companies wanting to get involved with React. And also we offer unlimited open source support, sorry, unlimited support for React to anybody who runs a charity or open source, sorry, charity. Yes, similar um, bodies that would like to use React. Sounds great. Um, that was rather garbled, but in other words, we're trying to help people out where we can free of charge. Okay, okay so thank you, Nicholas, and thank you for all the audiences to join in the session. And I, I would appreciate that you know, if, you uh, if you please rate the talk in this session and give a comment to the organizer. And the coffee break will be at the token lounge from 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. That's uh, it's already 2.01 p.m. But um, until 2.30 p.m. Central European time. And later for the track one, we'll have a track. We have a talk about COVID-19 contact tracing on the beam. The conference organizer would like all participants to visit the sponsors booths for supporting the sponsors and the exhibitors. And you can take part in the quiz and win books and about programming. You can find the link in the additional resources or in community board of the Hoover system. So thank you very much, and please do enjoy the conference. Thanks.